Hello and welcome along to the next part of the course. So here we're going to be focusing on the real world crystalware industry. We'll be looking at some key facts and figures uh, from recent years and some projections for upcoming years in terms of changes, things that are likely to impact on the industry. And we're also going to focus on how uh, this industry analysis is relevant to the pre seen case and the kinds of issues and questions that might come up uh, in the case study exam in February. So before I go into the details, let me just give you a quick uh, rundown of what we're going to be looking at. In the first section, we're going to look at some broad industry trends, some uh, key growth uh, trends in recent years, and the projections for upcoming years. We're also going to look at the broader luxury goods industry within which the crystalware industry is generally considered to fall. And then also uh, we're going to look at products, types, uh, ranges and pricing that occurs within this industry, just to give you a sense of where in the broader luxury goods industry, the crystal wear industry uh, tends to fall. We're then going to move on to labor and training. This is a more narrow focus, but a very, very important part of this industry. Uh, as we'll see, uh, the labor here is very specialized. A huge amount of skill and training is required. And then this will have implications as well for uh, bargaining power and broader political issues related to unions and unionization. Then we move on to some real world cases. We're going to look at two companies in particular perhaps the most recognizable brands within this industry, Waterford Crystal on the one hand and Swarovski on the other. We're going to be comparing and contrasting, looking at their different approaches and styles and strategies and also looking at some of the things that they have in common, just to give you a sense of what's the kind of standard within this industry. From there, then we're going to move on to threats and opportunities. We're going to be looking at some relevant changes in the broader economy and also some changes within the industry uh, that are likely to impact uh, on uh, companies uh, like Waterford Crystal, Crystal and Swarovski and indeed the company from the pre-scene uh, in coming years and some of the opportunities and dangers that these changes pose. From there then we'll move to the conclusion section where we will review uh, some of the key points uh, from the analysis and also try to draw out some implications in terms of likely issues that will come up in the case study exam in February. Okay, so let's get into it. We're going to start here with a graph that looks at absolute revenues from the different regions uh, from 2015. This is for the glass tableware market within which the crystalware uh, industry falls. You can see here Asia Pacific, perhaps unsurprisingly, is the leader in terms of absolute revenues, followed by North America, Europe, and then Middle East, Latin America and Africa falling quite far behind in terms of absolute revenues. Of course, Asia Pacific with the emerging market of China, unsurprising to see, is absolutely the largest in terms of revenues. Uh, due in no small part, of course, to China's major economic improvements in recent years, and that's going to continue, perhaps at a slower rate, but China will continue to grow as a, uh, based on the analysis of most major economists. And North America and Europe then, of course, also still very important markets uh, in this respect. You can see here, uh, according to TMR's analysis, that in terms of projections, they're looking from 2016 to 2024. Over the next year, eight years, expect a compound annual growth rate of 6.1% within this broader industry. Uh, not spectacular, but of course, uh, healthy enough uh, as well. So let's look at more detail here. You can see this is global luxury goods. As I said, we're going to focus on the broader luxury goods market because that is uh, the market within which the crystal ware industry works. You can see here uh, in recent years, things have been fairly steady, fairly unspectacular, quite uh, uh, modest year on year growth, but healthy nonetheless. And it seems to be moving in the right direction. So the luxury goods industry is in a fairly stable uh, condition, it seems, barring some uh, global financial uh, crises. It's likely that this trend will uh, continue uh, over the next five to six years. You can see there that's a fairly modest uh, and fairly steady year on year growth there. Uh, as for the online market, this is an important uh, area here. You can see there's been a very substantial growth in the online luxury goods market. This is something that is really, really important from the perspective, especially of crystalware manufacturers. We're going to be looking at the delivery issue in a little bit more detail uh, further on. But it's interesting to note the broader trend within the luxury goods market. People, it seems, are increasingly likely to buy online when it comes to luxury goods. Whereas traditionally for luxury goods, there was something of a, a kind of a uh, and a huge emphasis on the customer experience in terms of customers actually coming into 
uh, high-end stores and shops for luxury brands and having a really uh, personalized experience uh, maybe that they, they would have, for example, a, a very personalized sales assistant guiding them through the various products, explaining all of the details to them. Increasingly, it seems that luxury buyers are less interested in that or it's not as important a factor because they're increasingly looking online uh, just for convenience sake to make their purchases. And this seems to be applying across the board to all luxury goods, uh, not just uh, things like uh, cars or or. Um, uh, brought bigger purchases but also smaller purchases and, and especially personal luxury goods so we're going to come back to that because that is uh, significant for uh, crystalware uh, manufacturers as well as you can see here another broad uh, broad look at the luxury goods market uh, we're looking here at percentage growth for the different uh, segments within this luxury goods market we've broken it down here luxury goods luxury hospitality private jets fine wines and spirits fine food personal luxury goods, which is a very uh, broad market, and then other as well. As you can see, uh, personal luxury goods is the key here uh, because the crystalware would broadly fall within this uh, segment. And there has been a more modest growth here uh, in this segment, 2%, as compared to, for example, luxury cars, which have seen huge uh, growth, relatively speaking, 10% uh, in the same period. So we're really looking at... Um, a kind of a modest, relatively modest growth for the crystalware industry uh, in the context of the broader luxury goods market. So something to bear in mind, it's not likely that we will see spectacular growth in this industry, although as we will see, there has been something of a resurgence of interest in crystalware in particular. So we'll look here at some uh, qualitative analysis uh, in terms of projections for upcoming years. Uh, most uh, analysts agree uh, that cautious optimism is the uh, is the prudent outlook. Uh, as you can see in this article in the New York Times based on the Bain report, the peak of the largest nationality wave ever to benefit luxury goods is behind us, that is China. There's not going to be another China in uh, the next five to ten years, according to this analysis. That said, the growth we are seeing now is much healthier than before. That is to say it's a much more stable uh, trajectory. It seems a much more uh, secure year-on-year -year growth, steady, nothing, no, no major ups and downs. So that is the outlook for the next five years, it seems, based on the uh, expert consensus. There's a rising popularity then of fine dining across the globe, again due in no small part to the rise of the new, uh, new wealthy and middle class in China. Increasing number of restaurants and hotels as well, sp uh, cr sprouting up there and across uh, the emerging market zones. Rising standards of living uh, in developing countries, especially. Uh, so the, all of these things are, are good from the point of view of crystalware industry, of course. Uh, fine dining especially is important because a lot of crystalware is related to uh, gastronomy and uh, fine food and fine drink. On the other hand, there are uh, existing market, uh, markets for plastic and ceramic. And there uh, are designer uh, uh, versions of plastic and ceramic uh, as well for things like tableware and um, and kitchen and utensils and dining utensils and so on. So that is something that needs to be taken into account. Uh, and that might curb the growth somewhat of the global crystalware uh, uh, market, but one would expect that not too much because of course crystalware is in some sense a very distinct uh, uh, good uh, and can be very, very easily marketed as a distinct uh, good qualitatively from things like plastic and ceramic alternatives. Uh, here we see uh, an article recently from The Telegraph which does emphasize that there is a, has been uh, and continues to be a resurgence of interest in crystalware after something of a decline of interest in the uh, first decade of this millennium. As you can see here, this is a picture from Waterford Crystals Factory, a company that we're going to come back to uh, in a short, uh, short time. You can see here in this part of the article, they say these days they're gaining a new audience not long ago, decorative cut crystal felt out of tune with modern decor, a relic of another time, another wedding list, usually consigned to a cabinet and taken out for best, if at all. This is something I think uh, all of us can actually relate to. Uh, when we were growing up, for example, it was very typical for crystalware to be something that was just uh, put away uh, after having been received as a wedding gift and never used. Uh, maybe for the very exceptional occasions where something important, there was an important dinner, for example, in the house. But apart from that, 
uh, these were very, very um, um, unused or underused items and usually used ex exclusively for ornamental purposes. But now uh, we can see here the focus of luxury has returned to craft with traditional designer maker skills being celebrated in every aspect of our environment. And Crystal is, according to this uh, analysis at least, getting another chance to shine. We're going to come back to that uh, in the next couple of slides as we look at some product ranges and prices. In recent years, uh, crystalware companies have increasingly introduced designer ranges and limited editions. And this has been really crucial for uh, appealing to this new demand uh, that's emerged in the last five years or so. Waterford Crystal has been a leader in this respect and has commissioned, for example, Mad Men drinking glasses, which were based on the popular American TV series. Swarovski uh, likewise has a range of Disney and Star Wars crystal figure figures and memorabilia, which we're going to come back and have a look at soon. And Coloured Crystal as well has been making something of a resurgence in popularity recently, especially among younger consumers uh, who are looking to uh, uh, introduce style, uh, and 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 quirk to their to their drinking and to their fine dining and so on and, and color crystal seems to be uh, a preference for the uh, the kind of young wealthy and young upper middle class who are looking increasingly to uh, crystal wear. So now we're going to just have a quick look at a video of some of the ranges uh, that are on offer from these websites uh, for both Waterford Crystal and Swarovski. As you can see here, we've got the Mad Men uh, edition. Uh, and we've got many other uh, designer uh, ranges uh, on offer from Waterford Crystal, such as Jasper Conran, uh, John Rocha, uh, and many others. This is an increasingly uh, common trend within this crystalware industry to, co to commission uh, designers or famous, uh, famous fashion-related uh, figures to come in and, and create limited editions or, or new ranges of crystalware. Uh, this again is something that in particular appeals to the younger generations who are coming in and, and, and showing renewed interest in uh, crystal wear, especially when it comes to things like drinking uh, paraphernalia. Um, and this is really, really important for uh, the next few years. You can also hear, see here Swarovski. We're going to come back to these two companies again and compare and contrast them, but you can see they have Star Wars, for example, figurines and Disney uh, ranges as well. Uh, so a real variety of uh, kind of specialized uh, um, crystal wear here uh, that's trying to appeal to increasingly a diver diversified market. Now, prices is an important thing to consider here because luxury goods uh, is perhaps a little bit of a misleading categorization in some respects because some of these items and some of these individual uh, uh, products are actually within the price range of what you might consider the average person, especially in Western uh, developed nations. Uh, many people would actually be able to afford some of these individual items. And so the luxury uh, label can be a little bit misleading in that respect. It's generally categorized as luxury, but some of these items, as I said, are relatively affordable from the perspective of kind of the average income within uh, developed nations. Some drinking glasses, for example, uh, can be purchased for well under $100. And of course, it is relatively expensive for, uh, for a drinking glass if you're paying 60 or $70 uh, for it or the equivalent thereof. But still, uh, all things considered within the purchasing power range of most middle income earners within Western nations. However, it does range up much further than that. And you can see, for example, from some of the, the examples that we saw in the previous clip, there are sets and larger tableware pieces uh, from the crystalware industry that exceed $1,000. And that is generally uh, reserved for uh, the super rich or the, the, the very wealthy upper class uh, customers. So it does range quite considerably uh, so it straddles kind of that uh, middle middle range to very, very high range uh, items and collections. So you can see here, just to give you a sense, again, looking at one of these websites, uh, just a sense of the, the range uh, in, on the one hand for individual items like glasses in and around the $80 mark, for example. And then uh, some of the uh, bigger pieces and bigger ranges uh, can range up to a thousand uh, and beyond indeed for, for especially for designer associated products. Now I said we're going to look at labor, a very important area for many reasons as we'll see. Glass blowers in particular and master cutters, these are really, really important figures within the uh, manufacturing process. They're very highly skilled craftspeople and it really does require several years of training and apprenticeship 
uh, to get the requisite skills to produce these really, really imp- uh, like highly detailed pieces. In many cases, they are commissioned to produce uh, very, very specialized designs in accordance with very, very demanding uh, um, cuts and patterns. And so this requires a great deal of expertise uh, and experience. A five-year apprenticeship is generally considered the minimum for uh, for the average cutter, with a rigorous test uh, coming at the end of that period in order to ensure that they are uh, meet the, the the requirements. Often, um, uh, cutters in particular are required to um, they're actually required to perform particular kinds of cuts, and there are upwards of forty different cut types uh, for crystal wear. They're often required to perform these uh, from memory. Uh, and certain patterns as well that are signature patterns for particular uh, brands, they're required to cut them from completely from memory, not relying on uh, any kinds of designs or aids or visual aids uh, in many cases. So that's something that can be very, very challenging indeed. The average salary then, uh, perhaps surprisingly for a glass blower in the US, in terms of US dollars, is around uh, 30K per year, which in US terms is, is more or less a kind of a median salary. So although they do have very, very substantial skill sets, some of these glass blowers uh, and these master cutters, their salaries don't necessarily reflect that in terms of what you might expect for someone who is a very highly skilled and specialized uh, uh, laborer. We're going to come back to this because this has important potential implications from uh, the point of view of bargaining. But just before we get to that, let me just give you a, a kind of a sense of just how a painstaking this process could be. Uh, here we have a video of a glass blower, and you can see the amount of skill, the amount of care that's involved, and just how uh, uh, important it is to maintain a steady hand and to really know what you're doing. Uh, master cutters are similarly uh, uh, specialized, and, and the demands are similar uh, Similar in the case of master cutters. A huge amount of um, care is to, is required to perform these tasks. Very, very difficult. In some cases, actually quite dangerous. There are many hazards. Uh, for example, the heat of the furnace in this case and the heat of the actual glass itself. One has to be very careful not to actually touch it because we're talking about thousands of degrees here, uh, as was indicated in the pre-scene. So a huge amount of skill, care, expertise required here, and it's a really painstaking process. Now, in terms of bargaining power, this is a really, really important area. And as we'll see, has uh, caused some controversy for Waterford Crystal as well in the past. This is a highly specialized uh, uh, labor force. Uh, and this leaves the workers in a position, I would say, of relative, uh, relatively high bargaining power compared to uh, manufacturing laborers in other industries, perhaps, where it's more a focus on tasks that can be relatively easily uh, replaced. For example, if a worker is made redundant, they can be relatively quickly replaced and trained in, in most other uh, uh, manufacturing and assembly line uh, uh, industries in particular. However, here we're talking about a, a great deal of training that's required to bring in someone new, often taking years and years to get someone to the uh, required uh, uh, skill. And so that does leave these uh, glass blowers and cutters and master cutters in a particularly uh, strong position in terms of bargaining power. Unionization then, a common feature of the industry, uh, often you see collective bargaining on, on the part of these glass blowers and master cutters. And they have uh, trade groups, for example, and trade associations, a common feature of the industry. So that's something to bear in mind. Uh, and as we'll see in the case of Waterford Crystal, uh, the workers there uh, did exercise some of that power in their uh, recent uh, crisis in 2009. An interesting uh, quotation here from uh, uh, one of the workers uh, at uh, Waterford Crystal. He says, you can't be a designer unless you've been a master cutter. Explains Martin Ryan, who's responsible for the famous Times Square crystal ball and helps some of the fashion designers uh, translate their ideas onto crystal. Only then, he says, do you know what the crystal can actually take. No matter how modern a feel you're going for, it involves the same traditional techniques and you have to marry the shape and the cut. The design team drawing by hand, then translating designs into 3D on screen, 
get a kick out of daring the cutters with complex ideas to see what they're really made of. So this is really important as well because design cannot be simply separated from uh, master cutting and glass blowing indeed because one needs to know the precise limits uh, of these and limitations that apply to the cutting and the glass blowing process so often there's a great deg degree of consultation uh, and, and coordination that goes on between design teams and uh, the actual uh, uh, manufacturing teams on the ground and again that gives them that additional bit of bargaining power because of course not only are they relying on the master cutters and the glass blowers for the actual production and manufacture they're also relying on them to some extent to inform the design process so they're really vital at two very very important in two very very important processes now we're going to move to uh, some real world companies as i mentioned waterford perhaps the most recognizable crystal ware brand in the world they were founded in Wa County Waterford in Ireland in 1947 by a Czech immigrant, uh, Charles ba Basic, uh, Basic, I should say. Uh, he came in and there was already uh, a strong enough tradition of uh, crystalware and glassware manufacture in this part of Ireland until then, but it wasn't really uh, a, major, uh, a major global power by any stretch of the imagination uh, until uh, Charles Basic came in and really revolutionised the whole process. In 1987, after many years of success and growth, um, Waterford Crystal merged with English Potters Wedgwood to form a Waterford Wedgwood PLC. However, they began to face financial difficulties around the mid-2000s uh, with the closure of a factory in Dungarvan. And of course, the financial uh, global financial crisis was, uh, was the primary reason for this. Went into receivership in 2009 and then was eventually bought by the US equity firm KPS Capital. Since then, it's been sold to Finnish Home Products Corporation, Fiskars Corporation, in 2015. So it is uh, still based in Ireland. Uh, uh, many, there is manufacturing going on still in Ireland, uh, in, in Waterford. Indeed, they reopened a, manufacturing, a new manufacturing facility in 2010. 